Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry to say, um, this today's uh, presenter, uh, Karen Helga, uh, cannot come this conference because of the, her uh, family situation. But uh, this is the uh, she's talking about uh, this project, which is I also um, involved or involved in um, this project as a one of the member. So I'm going to try to uh, explain a little bit this project. It is called 20 Coastal Stations. Six artists uh, traveling together in Norway um, for so have to type in three weeks. IMC every time. Because two, two years ago, so it's a little tedious, but um, it's okay. Kai Helga, Nor Norwegian artist Kai Helga, and also uh, the one uh, lady uh, invited me to uh, join this project. So totally six artists traveling together. Kai Helga already uh, recorded a uh, uh, presentation, so you can you can see and you can hear the uh, presentation presentation. Floating along with twenty coastal stations, August thirteenth, two thousand and fifteen. I was waiting at the airport of Bude, a Norwegian coastal city north of the polar circle. I was to meet four artists from three different countries. Bess Frimudi and Åsa Andersen from Sweden, Arnu Vetanen from Finland and Katsu Toshi Yuasa from Japan. They were here to join the project 20 coastal stations, a project Elisabeth Alsostrand and I have been working on for over two years. An 18 days long voyage would take us along the Norwegian coast, starting in Bude in the north, then towards Sognefjordene and the island group Sulen in western Norway. Experiences of nature and culture would go hand in hand with the exploration of Woodcut. We embarked on 20 coastal stations to challenge ourselves and to reveal as well as trace unknown terrain and rare phenomena. Twenty coastal stations emerged from the international network of artists, craftsmen and theorists who work to preserve and further develop the vanishing Japanese woodcut. We live only for the moment in which we admire the splendor of the moonlight, the snow, the cherry blossom and the colors of the maple leaves. We enjoy the day, warmed by wine, without allowing the poverty which stares us in the face to restore our sobriety in this drifting. Like a pumpkin carried along by the current of the river, we do not allow ourselves to be discouraged for a moment. This is what is called the floating, fleeting world. This passage is from Tales from the Floating World of Pleasure, written by Asai Ryoi in 1661. The Japanese woodcut artist Hiroshige lived from 1797 to 1858, portrayed a journey between Kyoto and Edo in the series 53 Stations and the Tokaido Road. Inspired by this, we have devised a sea trip of 20 stops along the Norwegian coast. Our cultures that of Japan and Norway, share life by the sea as a common denominator. And in addition to drawing a picture of the trip, I reflect on how the project prompted unexpected encounters with the notions of the ancestral home and identity, and how the journey and the contrast in this floating world we were confronted with had impact on the work I produced for the exhibition. I recognize more and more the potential of Wodkut to become a tool for contemporary social commentary. With the arrival of the plane carrying the artist, summer entered at last. We were in northern Norway where the night was devoid of darkness. A landscape, magnificent and wide, 
unfolded beneath a never-ending dome of transparent blue-colored sky, lit up by a bright sunlight. My photos show a turquoise sea and an endless horizon, and they look like travel magazines' advertisements. But I couldn't land in this landscape. Within myself, a continuous tension rose, forcing an unsettled body and soul. I wondered if it was the responsibility for all the small organizational pieces that would need to be in place that caused this tension. After a week of exploring north of Norway, we boarded Hurtigruten, a somewhat luxurious tourist ship, which travels along the coast of Norway to continue to the next stop. Hours slipped away while sitting in the panoramic room. The horizon slowly floating by, and occasionally deserted stony islands broke its line. After a while, we approached West Norway and my home county, Song of Jorene. Barely perceptible, the physical presence around the ship changed. After having lived in constant light, the first raindrops alerted another landscape. Heavy grey formed clouds over the coastal town as the ship anchored by the docks. The dense green tinting the mountainsides promised a more humid climate. The white landscape was replaced by enveloping mountains. Something happened within me. That strong inner tension which I'd known during the trip so far evaporated. I was home. The project 20 coastal stations and the trip along the coast showed me how strongly I identify with the coastal landscape of Western Norway. Stronger than I thought. Zuland, the island and its nature and people makes my childhood paradise. Dotted by islands, Zuland's landscape lies at the furthermost tip of Western Norway. Steep mountains rise vertically from the sea. All is weatherthorn and constructed from stone formations. It's life between sheep and fish in a forbidding landscape, where occasionally there's a green spot or a white wooden house. Here my uncle Ingwald lived toiling on a coast of small holding. To survive, he had to develop an intuitive relationship with the landscape. Japan has a long-standing tradition of intuitive learning. Through a long observation of the teacher or the landscape, one acquires new knowledge and skills without either knowing or recording. I recall a primary school trip. We were four ten-year-olds who brought a rowboat. None of us could row. I placed myself strategically in the middle of the boat, while the others enthusiastically grabbed hold of the oars. After many oi and oh no and splashing, we ended up in the middle of the bay. Panic replaced enthusiasm. I grabbed the oars and with steady pulls at the oars, I rowed the boat back to the pier. Knowing what to do came from having observed Uncle Ingwald all those years. This insight gleaned from our adventure in the rowboat proved to me that I hold the Westland landscape in my bones. And in a global world I reflect upon, one can learn how to navigate in unknown terrain. But can one put down roots and transplant one's ancestral soil in an alien landscape? October 6, 2016, the exhibition 20 Coastal Stations opened at the Song of Jorene Museum of Fine Art. There are two main approaches one can recognize in the new work I developed during the project 20 Coastal Stations. Landscape as a tool to explore identity and Mokohanga print as a tool for social commentary. 
Prior to the arrival of the artists involved with Twenty Coast Stations, I cleared my family boat house in Solen, on the west coast of Norway. I found driftwood that my uncle Ingwell had collected living on a coastal small hold. The driftwood was to be used as firewood in the winter. I brought back the driftwood weathered by seasons and seawater to my workshop. These were the traces revealing a fascinating wooden grain structure. I decided to systematically catalogue the driftwood and in so doing it led to a more conceptual art piece with the title All Traces in a New Era, a Timeline. I used a rubbing technique called takuhon. Thin paper is placed over moist wood pieces. With a stamp made from a fabric ball, I push lightly and steadily with great care into the paper. Gradually imprints emerge from within the wooden block, in dark and light nuances. Stone formations, lines of the horizon and a wider horizon beyond pull together a timeline in this moment. It is a timeline that reaches towards both the past and the present. Influenced by the water and the pressure of my hand, the paper makes an image. Eventually it becomes a scroll that can be displaced, displayed and unrolled and then put away for the next time. On Hurtigruten I felt a great peace. I sat in a panoramic room with a view to the horizon and a bokashi colored sky. Suddenly, I was challenged by contrast in this floating world. My computer threw news into my lap. Refugees fought against the waves at Lampedusa in the Mediterranean. This experience inspired me to inquire if woodcut image of a landscape could become a topical social commentary. I made an installation consisting of three small showcases and one animation. The animation is called Freedom, Raft, Flight. The boxes have titles Your Own Horizons, Captured on Film and Indigo, Blue Time. In the installation I explore the contrast I experienced there and then. The beautiful Peace, War, Flight. The animation shows one origami crafted boat. I used woodcut to give the sheet a pattern. The paper boat gradually changes into a flat sheet of paper, a raft. The size of the boxes is taken from a souvenir chocolate box. In two of the boxes I've used mirrors. The back is open and by holding a photo of a horizon in front, one can see the horizon as if one were at the sea. In one of the boxes I attached a woodcut of an indigo sky. The boxes are in some way a prototype for souvenirs. It's a portable horizon in a box. The horizon has a peep show, so you can expand your horizon wherever you are. Stone formations and mist, a journey through Solent. By using woodcut, I approached a familiar environment through a new analysis. Doing so, I would like to arrive at a conscious understanding why Sulen's landscape fascinates me. I've reached new observation points in the landscape. A composition of a landscape is affected by its observation post. Changing this point brings new observations and points of view. I seek new views to develop these into abstracted expressions. Science in the landscape can be read as nature's written language. As a matter of fact, I still narrate my relationship with this landscape. Maybe my landscape can be open to others. Our digitized community provides increased availability, efficiency and flexibility for both work and privacy. Nature becomes an object through this development. Nevertheless, it is natural phenomena, like fog, that we cannot control. Dark shapes emerging in a fairy landscape may be graphic signs that can be read as omens and as reminders of nature's majestic stillness. 
In the picture landmark I have mounted a thin sheet to the print. On this thin sheet I have printed details and dark tones that gives a physical deepening to the print. Passing by, the sheet of paper shivers as a fog fading. This series of three images in blue tones is called To the West, Fjord and Havrand or Horizon. Each print is a variation of the same section in my childhood's landscape, Swoland. In 1790, Xavier de Mestre wrote Voyage autour de ma chambre. He investigated if it was possible to apply one's travelling mindset taking a trip around his bedroom. By using the method of Xavier de Mestre and the conscious shift of an observation point, I became fascinated by the shapes in between the stone formations. I removed the stone formations which sculpts the landscape. By placing bits of landscapes off as remnants, dividing it into the elements, into a treasure hunt, I open a fresh synthesis of known elements. Midwinter 2017. The floating world brought me to Oslo. I and two of the other participants in the project met at the National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design in Oslo. We were invited by Trine Noorkwelle, research resources assistant, to look at UKOA prints from the museum collection. Guided past the guards, we walked into a room furnished with a big table. The door was carefully locked and we were told that the bullet point pens and ink were banned in this room. A sense of reverence descended as the first prints were laid out on the table. Free of glass and frame, the images shimmered overwhelmingly in a glory of colors, lines, bukashi, karasuri and delicate kimono patterns. We saw, amongst others, Bienga and Surimono. Fluttering by in the stream of images, one startled me. At first glance, the woodcut looks like one of the many that I associate with Ukiyo-e. A woman sits on the floor in front of a wooden lattice. A broad black line etches the kimono of the woman and forms a central element in the image. Several long pins form a wreath around the head and her sculpted hair. Through this intimate meeting of eye and print, the picture reveals other layers. I distinctly sense that there is a sinister undertow beneath its initial impression. The pattern in the kimono transmits unrest. Several flame and spirit-like shapes spread across the fabric. The deep black bottom match of the kimono imprisons the figure within the picture. Both kimono and hairpins seem to weigh down the figure of the woman curled on the floor. Grasping the wooden lattice with the right hand, the figure is stuck in a grid. Her face is either painted white or free of makeup. More and more, the figure reminds me of a caged bird with clipped wings. The print is part of a series eight motifs that parody Yoshiwara around the clock. Utigawa Kunisara. Utigawa Kunisara lived from 1786 to 1865 and is also known as Utigawa Tokyokuni III. He was one of the most popular and productive ukiyo-e artists in 19th century Japan. In Europe, however, he was long regarded as an uninteresting representative of ukiyo-e. His prints were thought to be too complex, unclear, and extravagant use of vulgar colors. Yoshiwara was a famous and officially regulated brothel, district and Edo. Poor families rarely had no other choices than selling their daughters to a brothel as mates. Sometimes they were trained in traditional Japanese arts, such as the tea ceremony, calligraphy, ikebana, music and dance. More often, the girls ended up in the lowest rank of brothels, the so-called komise. In these lowest grade brothels, the girls were displayed behind a wooden lattice called harimise, a practice which finally vanished in 1916. 
the lives of the girls were brutal and very short. Confronted by the print, Evening Sun against the window lattice at the museum in Oslo unfolded the artistry of Utigawa Kunisada. I have been inspired by the beautiful light blue bokashi shapes in Hiroshige's woodcuts. Meeting this print, I wondered if Utigawa Kunisada's image was a critical social commentary. The Project 20 Coastal Station brought me new tools. I applied Japanese woodcut in print and sculptural shapes, in showcases and animations. With Mika, I found a new way of working with the surface so that grey tones take on a shine. Topical social commentary, identity and intuitive learning find a place in my creative landscape. We, the participating artists, still have contact and new ideas will arise. So also after the exhibitions, the journey continues. People forget how long Norway is. It's a long country. Such a long country. The coastline is enormously long. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, incredibly, the distances are quite unimaginable. Yeah. Yeah. So Bodu is uh, over the uh, Arctic yeah. line, so it's the really north part of Norway. Then we studied uh, Bodu to um, Bergen, 
Bergen is really not uh, south of Norway. Bergen is about the same latitude as Shetland Islands, <laughs> north of Scotland, north of Britain. Were you able to see any of those amazing northern lights? Is that we do you see that in Norway? Oh, a little bit. Because it is the rain, uh, summertime, so mm -hmm. it's not so clear, but we saw the little bit. Wintertime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, Lucy May Schofield can't be here today, so I am reading it, uh, reading her uh, uh, paper for her. Um, so uh, the paper is called "The Moon and the Sledgehammer: A Dialogue in Print" uh, on Lucy May Schofield, and you can see her work, the actual work from this uh, uh, regarding this paper in the exhibition. Um, so it's about a collaboration she did. Oops, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, during late spring of 2015, while the sakura trees still clung to their final cherry blossom petals, I travelled to Fujikawa Ruchiko to attend the Mi Lab basic training program. Until then, my only experience of woodblock carving was making a New Year's card an image of Mount Fuji depicted as an English Christmas pudding, while wrapped up under a katatsu in Kyushu, where I've been living for the past year. The five intensive weeks at Milab changed my approach to printmaking forever. During the residency, artists from Canada, Ireland, Malaysia, Chile, and Switzerland studied together. With eight languages spoken amongst us, we found various ways to communicate with teaching French, English, Spanish, Japanese and even mine, when nothing else worked. The lab was not only <clears throat> an immersive environment to study Mokohanga, but also a space to exchange printmaking techniques across cultures. Long conversations developed over the weeks through cooking and eating together, and friendships were forged that will remain forever. Milab is a place that encourages experimentation. In learning the techniques employed by master carvers and expert printers, I felt free to adapt and interpret <coughs> what I was learning into my own practice. I was inspired by the various approaches of the other artists alongside the visiting teachers. With little distraction and long studio days stretched out ahead of us, we soon developed a daily rhythm. We lost track of the days, weekdays merged into weekends, April into May. The satisfaction of the day's carving was evident in the sigh our bodies made when we sat down for dinner together, or in the sound of a cold beer being opened and kampai resounding throughout the house. After our evening meal, we could be found applying camphor oil heat patches to each other's sore shoulders, lower backs and wrists, or monitoring the development of newly formed hand calluses. My hands, fluent in bookbinding, were beginning to learn a new language. The intimacy of the residency program created an open environment, welcoming of questions, further explanations, and repeated demonstrations. Our many visiting sensei were patient, generous, and approachable. We were invited to observe them working on their own woodblocks, to learn directly from watching them create. Each of our teachers had a different methodology in their printmaking and teaching practice. By, be by being granted the time and space for self-directed study, we could learn in the doing of the process and not simply in the watching. Through persistence and practice, I gradually fell into the natural flow imposed by the techniques. The process required me to slow down. It was clear that even if I was in a hurry to complete something, the task would not allow me to hurry. In my gradual understanding of the process, I became more drawn to its allure. I slowly, quietly, calmly, and completely fell it was while cooking and carving that I developed a connection with Guillaume Brisson-Darvaux, a French-Canadian artist from Montreal. 
he has the most infectious and wonderful laugh, as well as a very unique approach to Mokahamba. As a sculptor and printmaker, uh, Guillaume's prints were playfully three-dimensional, creating images printed with mica and sculpting them to form glistening rocks he then placed in the residency garden. Throughout the residency, we cooked together, exchanging French, Japanese, Canadian, and English recipes. We also ran to the Kawaguchi Lake together most mornings, each finding a daily rhythm together. We began to create a space for collaboration and exchange through learning from one another. One year later, in the following spring, Guillaume and I explored the collaborative potential we had developed at MeLab further in California. We traveled to Berkeley, San Francisco, for a two-month joint printmaking residency at Carla Art Institute. Carla welcomes artists and residents from all over the world as a studio dedicated to printmaking. Our proposal was to create a new body of prints as a dialogue between us, as individuals, as artists, and between our practices. Meaning was sometimes lost in the misinterpretations of the French and English language. In creating prints together, we hoped that cross-cultural dialogues could occur. We were interested in exploring ways that narrative is created, connections are made, and memory is maintained. But if you just came in, Lucy May Schofield couldn't, uh, couldn't make it, so I'm just reading. We were both nervous. We were used to working very differently in terms of scale and production in our independent studios. Yet there were similarities in us each being drawn to Mokahanga and having a playful approach to our practices. We had never worked together before and I wondered how we would navigate this collaboration in an unfamiliar studio in a new city to us both. We spent a few weeks dancing around each other, too nervous or shy to take the lead testing ideas that we wanted the other to approve or, or be pleased by. We both tried hard to connect with the other's working methodology and visual language, arguably compromising our own voice and voices in order to find a connection point. Perhaps we were afraid of the collaborative process not working. We were trying too hard to satisfy the aesthetic of the other. Two weeks into the residency, we were both frustrated and confused and had lost sight of what we wanted to do. We confronted one another and after a heated discussion decided to begin again. This time we put a framework in place. We established some limitations. We needed to work alone to find our voices. We decided to create ten prints in an edition of eight to the same dimensions using any print process available to us. We had four weeks to work on them. After that time, we would exchange our series of prints in order to respond to the others, forming a conversation between us. We took tentative steps towards a conversation about colour by agreeing to choose a palette together. We each had a somewhat limited use of colour in our previous work so we took a long walk around Berkeley to discuss the personal associations we had regarding colours. The array of speedball and jacquard screen printing inks available in the US was huge, as well as the generously large tubes of whole vine watercolours. We talked about our love for the colours of desert sunsets, the Californian heat, the sand dunes and salt flats of Death Valley and the colours of our dreams. We chose a selection of pinks, fluorescent reds, golds, coppers, pearls, and velvety blacks. This step forward allowed us to start our dialogue together about our conceptual and visual expectations of the collaboration. Guillaume got to work silkscreen printing cutouts he had created and I experimented with water-based suminogashi and marbling techniques. As we both began to find a way of working together efficiently in Carla's studio, early prints began to emerge. With each week into the residency, we became more a part of the community of local and international artists, working alongside Japanese, German, Chinese and English printmakers. I have always found printmakers to be amongst the most generous artists.
perhaps due to the type of equipment needed to make prints. Artists are used to working outside their studios in shared communal spaces, where being aware of others working around you is paramount to creating a happy, workable space. Carla became a home from home, just as Milad had. We knew we would be short of time to get all of the prints completed by the end of our time in Carla, so we worked late into the night and in the sunlit back garden of the house where we were staying. We didn't want to rush the process, but it was important we each had ample time to respond to the other's prints. Each print needed to be left the space for the other artist's response to create the print dialogue we desired. <coughs> Within the collaboration, I was able to free myself up from the usual constraints I place on myself, like having a clear idea of the finished print before I begin. I drew directly onto plywood, carved and printed the image, but then had the freedom to experiment with the image by cutting, deconstructing, rearranging and collaging. This technique suited the way I make images much more than planning each stage of the print as I'd previously done with Mokohanga. It allowed flexibility towards making decisions based on what worked or didn't work together. Some of the prints I discarded in the first two weeks of the collaboration I kept aside, not ruling them out completely and with the possibility of reworking them later on. It was exciting to see the prints take shape the inks we had selected became the unifying element. Our deferring sensibilities were reflected in the forms we'd each created, yet as a whole, it felt as though we were creating a language together. We created space in each print to reflect, consider, and create a dialogue as part of the exchange. As the weather, <clears throat> as the weather warmed up and the light in the studio grew longer, so did our hours spent printing. Six weeks into the residency, we each felt ready to set up a space in the studio to lay out our prints for the exchange. By this time, we had nurtured a sense of trust, secure in the knowledge we would respond to each of the prints in whichever way we felt we needed to, and with that, in our own individual sense of authorship would dissolve. As soon as we exchanged our prints, I felt comfortable about responding to Guillaume's work the prints were open, leaving space for me to answer. We each adopted a different approach to creating our individual responses. Guillaume took a photograph of the collection of my ten prints and used Photoshop to explore color, form, shapes and scale in order to plan his responses carefully. I took a more physical approach, using paper cutouts and samples of watercolors on washi to gauge my responses playing with form, shape, and composition, switching, discarding, and manipulating each added element before committing to an idea. There were a few prints that I found difficult to respond to because they already seemed so complete as prints. I delayed making decisions about these few and focused on what felt instructive. Sorry, uh, sorry to, to interrupt. Can you go back? Uh, um, do you happen to know... No, oh, sorry, the, the last one previous. No. The one that you just yeah, this one. Oh, yeah. Do you know which who's Oh yeah, which side is Neil and which yeah. side is yeah. it doesn't matter in a way. Oh uh, no, that's I really... was just it doesn't really matter. It does. Well <laughs> 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 Well no, no, no. So we can all get yeah. it's interesting. There's, well, a, there's a kind of similar huge similarity actually. Yeah. I think it's the one, isn't it? Does anybody know? Anybody at Carla at the same time? No, but in the, oh, in the picture of which is carving, carving the ladder. The ladder. Yeah. 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 So the ladder. Oh, yes, she yeah, has a silver screen. Yeah. 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 That's a bit more silver screen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, the ones on the right look a little bit more sculptural. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Be fun when she watches the videos. <laughs> 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 So where were we on that one? Yeah. Okay. The combination of silkscreen and mokohanga created texture and depth, a perspective that held the eye. 
the conversation we were having in print was cyclical repetitions of balance and instability, solidity and vulnerability. Whispers and shouts, caresses and punches of color re-emerging. As the collaboration progressed, we both talked about the development of our responses. On several occasions, we both felt frustrated that the idea we had wasn't working in print. At these times, we talked it through, eager to glean the other's expertise in how we could make adjustments or alter our response altogether to find resolve in the image. Yet we were mindful to consider just the aesthetic elements while our silent conversation remained in print. With the final week of our residency upon us, we both felt we both individually and method methodically responded to the final prints in the collaboration, each of us having left the most challenging contributions to the last few days, leaving as much time as possible to let the right response surface. As Guillaume continued to print, I turned my attentions to adopting a technique to get the finished prints to dry flat at Carla. Because the nature of the prints were a combination of silkscreen printed acrylic ink on cotton rag paper, alongside collage, kozo, and gambi washi with nori paste, the base paper reacted to the moisture by coughing and warping badly. We were desperate that this reaction didn't detract from the finished prints, so spent days exploring options of how to get them flat. I sprayed the reverse of each print with a light mist of water and placing them on a bed of corrugated cardboard sandwiched between acid freeboard and newsprint. The sophisticated drying system at Carla meant that the 160 finished prints were dried slowly with an electric blower, gently distributing air into a cloth bag and down channels over a period of days. The prints emerged flat, but due to the sheer amount of prints in the edition, the process took seven days to complete. The final days at Carla were full of productivity and decision making. We edited the series of 20 prints to 18, highlighting a narrative arch within the selection, at last seeing each other's responses and connections to each print. Together, we reworked the ordering as if numbering pages in a book. We signed and numbered them with phases 1 to 15, inspired by our, by our common moon, the same moon wherever you are in the world. We named the series The Moon and the Sledgehammer. We see them as a visual and emotional correspondence between us as artists. This dialogue was motivated by the desire to know more about one another and feeds from the experience of the present. From these playful exchanges, a new vocabulary arises specific to the meeting of two universes conversing to create one. This dialogue implies a particular attention to the other's sensibility whilst inviting us to redefine our own. The 15 phases of prints explore the idea of what collaboration means to us as artists and how the two versatile print mediums of silkscreen and mokohanka form a bridge between our independent practices as well as challenging our perceptions of their limitations. This collaboration has provided me with an insight into the way another artist generates ideas and produces work. It has been a vital time for me, cementing a new direction in my practice, one of collaboration and creating a dialogue through print. Over the course of working together, I felt inspired and energized by this new approach to collaboration. I hope in the coming years, I will go on to nurture new relationships with artists in the international print community to create more work in this way. In creating a space for making, cultural boundaries are blurred and connections fostered. The sharing of stories, conversation, language and memory through both oral and making traditions can be a tool for communication and connectivity. Print mediums like Mokohanga and places like Milan are incubations for this type of collaboration and connectivity to be nurtured. That's the end.
Um, did they did they actually work on the same um, work or they separate works just side by side? That's why I wasn't. Oh uh, no, I think they. Um, I suspect yes. I think for example now we know a bit more. I think this would be the more hand element, and that would be the silver Does anybody know more about this uh, this portfolio? Yeah, just from the one in the show. Oh right. Yeah, you can see the two. Yeah, so it's probably yeah. worth having a having a good look at that. Very inspiring, isn't it? I'm recording questions for her, so yeah. um, if anybody has questions that can't be answered and you're interested in knowing the answers, like yeah. give me your email address and I'll send you your email. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, questions. Yeah, because to combine the water based with screen print is mm. one repels and it's not an easy thing to do. That's right. But here it's book. Oh, here it's in work. It's clean could be water-based as well. Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't know. She said it was acrylic. Oh, there's there's another question. Um, was the, uh, where the uh, screen print? You can portrait. get acrylic screen print. Um, okay. Well, I just want to thank you. You have got such a pleasing voice, really. Yes. <laughs> 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 love to have you reading <laughs> my <laughs> bedside <laughs> <and> some stories. <laughs> Ralph sounds like you're doing bedtime stories tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not we don't see you. <laughs> we don't know what's happened if we don't see you. But aside from your lovely voice, I think mm. it's also a wonderful project. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's natural. I heard that it makes a difference. It was interesting to, to hear a little bit more about it. I think it's a pretty probably because, you know, the process was so intense in terms of um, presenting it here. Yeah. Um, uh, I would have liked to see more images of, of the process, but I think, yes. I think that if you're so involved, that's probably quite hard to do, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to work out what you're doing and, 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 and recording and stuff. So. That's right. Has anybody here done a collaboration mm -hmm. in a similar way? Yes, yes. For example. Here, so of course, because you're working with, your, with wood and paper. Uh, yeah. Box. Do you actually, three, the three of you print together on the same piece of paper? We don't, but I've done other collaborations. Actually, at um, France Montreal, with two other people where we actually worked on on the same piece of paper drawing and printing, would you passing say, it over. Right. Would, you, would you say that some of the things that she mentioned were pertinent to what you did? Yeah, I think there's a lot of... Um, of negotiations and I mean I missed the beginning part I came in a little bit late but there was a lot of conversations I think half of the time you're talking um, and because you can't actually be working in the same space all the time so you're, you're talking a lot and then kind of picking the work and then doing something to it and then bringing it back and then talking again, mm -hmm. and I, I remember that that was a lot of um, big part of the process, and kind of big for me it was just letting go yeah. <laughs> and letting yeah. the other person invade my okay. work yes. space, and kind of also the harder thing for me was to um, give myself permission to actually do something on top or erase or you know invade there work in some ways, which was difficult at first, but I think there's, we kind of eventually developed a degree of trust, and I, it took about a week at least to kind of get to that point of working every day. I think it was interesting because uh, although she worked quite alongside him in uh, Kaliguchiko, but they had that two weeks where they, they kind of mistimed and uh, didn't get it right, I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting. Mm -hmm. you, there would be a temptation perhaps to rush into it, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. if you weren't confident, you might never say anything, and then uh, it would be, it would, 
the whole process would be quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to be, as you say, trust. Mm -hmm. And um, just one question about the earlier statement about sculptural stones, the fascinating yeah. stones yeah. with the mica. Yeah. Um, do you know what material he carved those little facets, those facetted forms? Um, the yes, is that? What's no, that, that might be another question, which uh, maybe we can go back to uh, Lucy. Yeah. And, and even Guillaume, actually, is he, is he answering this question? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I was interested about that. Yeah, it's a nice yeah, that's right, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, quite interesting in relationship to Paul's work as well. Kind of. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wrapping forms, prints around forms, I would imagine they are, they are just paper. Which paper, is that's what I do like. Into yeah. that shape. Mm -hmm. With All mica dust mm -hmm. on top mm -hmm. to look like a rock. But, so it mind it does. It does seem to relate to the shape that's immediately in front of them, doesn't it? That mm -hmm. shape oh, looks yes. as though it could be cut out and yes. Yes. assembled yes. into yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a shape. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. It's nice just to see the, 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 the two-dimensional and the three, it's an installation. Yeah. Yeah. And this yoga posture there, so he's standing on his... <laughs> 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 this is our connection. <laughs> you have to laugh. It's his printing position. You <laughs> 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 want to stand here on the top of the head and... <laughs> that is <a> natural <laughs> press. It's very impressive. <laughs> Natural press. Because lots of ovals. Stamping. Ovals. That we could, yeah, we could have that as an event or, or happening. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll stop there and the lecture you need to set up. Oh, yes. So. Thank you for being here and hear my presentation. I'm Elettra Gorni, I come from Italy. I practice Mokuhanga and I attended the Nagasawa Artist Residency in 2008. But also I work as a teacher. I teach Italian literature, Latin language and history of art in the Italian high school that's called Liceo. The experience as a teacher especially teaching, teaching Latin language, put me facing a big question. How information and content can be carried successfully by a teacher or an artist to the public? A language, a grammar, a syntax are needed in order to communicate successfully. And the further questions follows this first one. Can be found out an organized language in Japanese old Mokuanga. Um, with my short uh, presentation, I will try to um, put some seeds about this to try to answer. <laughs> so, first of all, I would like to dedicate my talk to Weba Sensei, who told me how to print according to the Mokohanga method during the artistic residency at Nagasawa in 2008, and to Keiko Kadota, to whom I'm and I will always grateful for having conceived and led the Nagasawa residency, and in general to have a thought that Mokohanga could become an instrument of knowledge and cultural exchange. The observations I will explain in the next 20 minutes are my humble attempt to understand the receipt and the alchemical mix by which Japanese woodblock prints are so attractive and full of charms and successfully communicative. My goal is to make an attempt to organize a series of suggestions that affect me emotionally every time I start working on a print and I seek inspiration surfing on the online library databases that preserve Japanese prints. I'm trying to figure out if these suggestions are only my subjective impressions or actual recurring items attributable to a distinctive aesthetic folk, a Japanese taste that has consequences in the representation of the space. 
Since I started using the Mukyohanga technique in my artistic production, I have been convinced that a working method brings its own unique aesthetic, a special influence on the work produced by it. This occurs in a special way when making prints relating to landscape using the Mokuhanga technique. This time, I focused my attention to the space and its narrative value in the set of fan print, fan prints Shika Shashinkyo, made by Hokusai. My intention is to show that Mokuhanga technique provides Hokusai with specific resources, for example, the Bukashi gradation, narratively effective. The technical and expressive support coming from Mokuhanga, mixed with iconographic motifs typical of the traditional Eastern spatial representation, for example, the presence of waters, mountains, sky, clouds, and mistness, contributes to the building of a visual and narrative syntax specific of Japanese bookblock prints. I started thinking about this research three years ago when um, I was preparing the paper for IMC 2014, where I discussed the composition of the subjects in the traditional Japanese Mokuhanga prints and the role that some features of the technique, such as the Bokashi gradient, had in getting the description of the space of the classical prints we all love. Among the images I had chosen to illustrate my theory, one particularly I liked most. It was a Hokusai woodcut belonging to the Shika <coughs> Shinkyo series. Uh, in detail is this one, the seventh one, titled the Tokuza Kari. There was something in this print that went beyond the use of Bokashi in obtaining the rendering of the empty and full space, something that went beyond the traditional composition of Sino-Japanese painting called Sansui. Shika Shashinkyo literally means true to life mirror. Given that the print was intended to be a true to life mirror of a poetic text without using written words, it was not difficult to understand what was profoundly attractive in this work, the controlled, almost grammatical use of the space. Instead of using ideograms and words that speak to the rational mind, the space is described by following a compositional syntax made of alternations weighted and distributed with great care. Alternating the three dimensions, vertical, horizontal and di diagonal, alternating gradients and lines, using void, void and signs and fullness of color, or density of signs and their reflection, and rhythm, and talkatives or silence areas, depending on the needs of the visual narration. I will focus my investigation on this print not before giving a general picture of the work to which it belongs. Shika Shashinkyo is a series of 10 literary prints produced by Hokusai in 1833-34, developed as in a vertical format called Naga Oban, Human beings are the main subject. In this case, famous Chinese and Japanese poets or protagonists of their poetic works seen in specific moments of their history. This is a series directed to a learned audience, full of references and details that only those who knew the lyrics and the authors represented could fully understand. The scholars who talked about this series emphasized the great role that the psychological representation of the characters has in it, given that Oksai Inten, stated in the title, was to build a true-to-mirror portrait of ten poets referring to the ten prints of the series. However, this would be a portrait in the oriental terms. The true representation of the subject uh, doesn't depend from the realism or veracity of physical representation, but from the psychological deepening. Hokusai aims to achieve it, not so much by the hatching and the description of faces, 
as with the relationship between human figures and the natural environment in which they are placed. It is precisely through the ten natural settings of this prince that Hoxai finds the way to tell without words the stories and feelings of the human figures represented. The landscape becomes a psychological deepening tool that exalts and amplifies the feelings of the characters, such as melancholy, nostalgia, dedication and memory. This operation is carried out by Oxide exploiting, uh, exploiting the entire arsenal of the figurative tradition and the oriental aesthetics, customizing it with the resources that xylography has made available to him. I will speak briefly and by points about the observation that the series Shika Shashinkyo has triggered. The first, the depicted space is symbolic. The eastern aesthetic of the Sansui landscape is known and respected by Oksai. We will find in this print the typical elements of the Sansui landscape representation that are water, mountains, rocks. The Japanese word Sansui means mountain, sun, and Sui is water, mountain water. Second point. The peculiar component of oxide resides in the role given to these typical and traditional elements. They are no longer only represented in a typical order, but are used to tell something by the disposition of individual elements and by the use of colors. Third, uh, as a narrative component, rocks, mountains, water mirrors, water courses, sky, waves, and bridges acquire a syntactic value. Rock in the foreground, alternating with watercourse waterfalls, alternating with fog, alternating with the cane thicket, and all point to a precise visual, visual rhythm in accessing the image. It is as if each natural element constituted a descriptive thread. To show this, I deconstructed the image. Starting for the first stage, we have the rocks, then the rhythm of the small waterfall on the river, followed by the curved Chinese bridge on which the protagonist walk, walks. Then there is ground embankment, and the protagonist facing up gaze drives us to the other stretch of water, this time quiet. Wedging at a corner in a rocky shore, leading us to the fog, and then to a cane thicket, followed by a descriptive silence consisting in the fo of the fog, followed by the density of a cane thicket's marks, then clear contrasting spots of two trees, behind the above which opens the night, described at first with a mist cloud, then the full moon, and finally the sky, described only by the color and by the Bokashi gradient. Fourth, not only the natural elements are skillfully, skillfully alternated to narrate as a story, the rhythm of the signs tells, the rarefaction of the signs tells, the diagonal cut tells, the empty space alternating with the design space tells. Even the gradient color tells. We note that some Bokashi nuances and gradations can replace detailed descriptions and artifices such as fog, vapors and clouds can be used to lighten the represented space and the void is aimed to be an active and meaningful element of the description. Fifth. Because of the features described above, we can say that the picture, the, the picture space is a naturalized human space, where nature is organized to communicate and connect with the human being. We can think that they are landscaped gardens. One of the prints, this one, called Minamoto no Toru, referable to the Japanese court poet Toru Daijin, is also helping us with this association and suggesting it. The protagonist is Minister Minamoto no Toru, who had recreated a maritime landscape of northern Japan in his garden. The print 
represents him while finding his fictional landscape in surrounding nature. Sixth, there are Japanese treatises on the art of garden composition, such as Saku Teiki or another one, Sansui Narabini no Gata no Zu, that can provide us with many insights to better understand the sense of the landscape for the Japanese culture and in Hokusai. In Japan, an intuitive vision of nature and the cosmos was cultivated and elaborated through the practice of meditation. Second, art, whether to physically compose a garden or to compose it graphically as Oxai did in this print, played an important role in this way of intuition. Art is, te te is the technique, the rational ordering that connects and manifests intuitive and spiritual vision. The Oriental Garden, even when, even when represented graphically, is a figurative symbiosis of right angle and natural form. Eight, the technical path of building a garden, and these ten brains are ten gardens, is to recreate natural landscapes by providing the elements that make them evocative. Typical elements are very water, such as rivers, waterfalls, ponds, and sea, or stones, such as rocks, earth, mountains, or wood, vegetation, often trees and shrubs, to a lesser extent flowers, and bamboo, such as forests, as well as buildings and roofs. The object of the evocation is the energy, the force, the intuitive transmission of sentiment, the landscape of the garden becomes a device of beneficial energy and allows to accord human existence to natural rhythms. Ninth, there is both for garden and for this time garden prints a variety of landscapes, marine, river, lake, hills, and mountain ranges. Hoxai uses all this repertoire in the ten natural composition of the Shika Shashinkyo and also implements the principle of Oriental Garden aesthetics, according to which the order of the arrangement of the, ver of the various elements must not be either geometric or random, but must follow a specific intention designed to compenetrate natural rhythm and human intervention. Tenth. Finally, the Mokuhanga technique plays an important role in this mechanism of humanization and narration of the landscape. The logic of nature as a narrative tool, the use of Bokashi technique, becomes essential to depict the silence, the poses, the caesuras among the presence of dense and rhythmic signs, while the carving of the signs gives life to the literally speaking part of the visual narrative. And uh, at, the, uh, at last, Japanese stylography is essentially a painting tool, in my opinion, not just a tool of graphic serial reproduction. Printing from wooden matrices with semi-transparent colors allows to give the color multiple features, flat surfaces, an interrupted transition from one color to the other, tone depth thanks to the repetition of print passages, or without the heating and personalizing presence of the brush stroke. The appearance that comes in a, is abstract but vital, detached but radiant, profound and meditative, as Eastern aesthetics requires art. Hoxai seemed to me the most interesting also to analyze, thanks to the maturity of his technique and language and because of his deep link and refinement of the Japanese xylographic tradition. Being able to introduce and master a new vision of space, the Western perspective and the chiaroscuro, being able to balance this, this innovation with the Eastern aesthetic tradition, and for this, from this crossroads being able to create a new way of representing nature enhancing its emotional, sentimental role, then no, knowing how to exploit technically and linguistically the expressive features that the xylographic medium offered. Let's remember a technique considered minor to the painting. 
uh, all this seems me to me poetic and artistic drivers still shareable and desirable today. Thank you. I visit, just two weeks ago, I visited an um, exhibition in Paris at the Guimet Museum that uh, um, uh, exhibited a, a series of prints from different uh, print, uh, artists, um, sp all speaking about language. And uh, Shika Shashinkyo were represented, but as scenario, as scenery, um, like something in the theater, uh, nothing at first stage. Uh, so they made the critics at Guimet Museum said the, the most important thing are people, and then the landscape is only um, like a scene in the theater. Said so I don't agree with the idea because, in my opinion, the landscape is interactive is uh, uh, deeply bounded with the people represented. And uh, Okuzai is uh, great using this readons from uh, between the landscape and the people to describe something we all consider delicate, elegant. But I think we have to start thinking about this brain as a language, like some uh, kind of language we sometimes understand, sometimes we have to search about it. About. And uh, language is um, not only a description, but also references to the cultural uh, situation uh, and uh, even where uh, uh, Oxide lived. So uh, using rocks is not only because there are rocks in the uh, nature, but because the rocks are memory. Uh, rocks are heard with memory. So you will find always in Japanese prints, uh, in Edo period and also before, rocks. But uh, it's not a decorative motif. It's uh, something that's spir it's spiritual. It's very deeply connected with the uh, uh, culture. And, uh, I think uh, I like to um, study this uh, mix, these uh, uh, hidden uh, uh, things uh, that uh, this print is so beautiful and celebrated, uh, still uh, um, uh, I have to, to, to say, uh, to revelate. Hey, uh, um, I understood that there was some text first and then Oxide made kind of a uh, without text, uh, like a series. The, the prints are without text. All yes, ten prints uh, are without text. Is the text, uh, is it uh, from one uh, person writing There text? are, uh, what because I use uh, different sources for okay, this print. many uh, texts uh, from many stories, like poems. Yes, and yes. So it is just like poetic... Um, Sometimes there are um, like, uh, if, if, um, as I can say, um, the text attached to the... Sometimes are uh, fiction. So we can in, okay, fiction. In yes. selected cases, this is fiction. So they are uh, protagonists of uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are, uh, these, uh, they are uh, real people uh, mm -hmm. who live in uh, old times and uh, who practice poetry. Mm -hmm. all, uh, all, uh, all the ten prints are inspired by uh, written text written by or uh, poets or um, high people like politics. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the prince represents or protagonists or the authors. Mm -hmm. But it's not very important. The, uh, com uh, the audience was very high in understanding the yeah. meanings. They were reading the, uh, the pictures without the text, they knew what Yes, happened. there are uh, strong re uh, references for someone who knows the stories. Mm. Also, the seventh is a story known. And uh, Oxai didn't need to use uh, uh, words. Yes. 
And this is a strange, uh, it's a special case of this, because uh, um, we have uh, a lot of prints with uh, written text. Mm -hmm. This case, that, but they are ten literary prints, and uh, the Yokozai um, used different uh, sources mm -hmm. and uh, created his own story. So I found the description of these stories on the British Museum uh, website. Uh, some of these prints are described very well. But uh, all the critics uh, agree that it's, uh, Ukusai uh, wrote the story uh, with images. It is like a, we have got in Finland an epic uh, story, Kalevala, it's the... the yes. Well, what is this in English? Curry. <laughs> it's the, the National Epic of Kalevala. It's not the translation. Yes. How the, yes. uh, the world was um, born and everything. And if we have a picture or a painti painting from some part of the poem, so Finnish people know immediately what it is yes. about. And yes. they maybe sing the, the song. <laughs> yes, but here maybe... So this is maybe the same situation. So Japanese I people so. knew immediately what is going on. This, uh, the public is an elite, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yes. it's know. like uh, the uh, Odyssey or the uh, Iliad. Yes, yes, yes. everybody It's uh, rewriting is something yes. that's a uh, cultural uh, heritage. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the British Museum, but there's currently an exhibition on late Hoxide there. Did you see that show at all? I wonder if you've seen the exhibition at the British Museum of now going on? It's now on. Mm -hmm. Currently on. Hoxide. Hoxide later career, the second half of his career. I be, uh, sorry, I, need a, I don't know if I understand. Yeah, there's an, Paul said there's an exhibition of late Hoxide prints at the British Museum now. Did you now, see? yes, but there are a lot of exhibitions about Hoxide. Oh, no, my, question, my question was not really that. The question was, in his later career, Hoxide did a series that he didn't complete which is called A um, Hundred Poems Retold by a Nurse. Do you know the series? I, I know the series, but I, have a, I know a lot of prints, so I don't remember them right now. I was only going to ask, do you think there's some connection between the two, this set of ten and the set that was not completed? I wondered if there's any connection that you could see. Um, I think it, it changed his name and it changed the way to represent things all along his life. So, uh, connections are for sure. But uh, the, I'm in Paris, the um, exhibition about landscape uh, was talking about the perception of the landscape. So, the prints were connected about a subject. So, this is a way to approach a big uh, um, production by Yokusai. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to so uh, the, I'm not a specialist about Oxai. I like to find uh, in Japanese prints something that I need to understand about the beauty of Japanese prints. In this case, the uh, narrative uh, use of the landscape for me is very imp it's, uh, it's important. So I chose uh, Okusai, but I prefer Hiroshige. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but Hiroshige is like. Um, is another field, it's a photography, the, um, another kind of memory. This is literature, so you can uh, speak about grammar and syntax with these points, because there is a syntax in uh, uh, introducing you to the story. You are guided, led in the print. It's not only, oh, that's beauty. You uh, have a different moments to, to understand uh, all the things are, that are described. And I think it's uh, something very sophisticated and not uh, not uh, very well studied yet. Because uh, the people uh, focalize about, about the beauty, about the technique, through Tekoxai is understood, it's great. But um, the idea to uh, use uh, the language, to find a language in this brain, is still to, to research about. <laughs> how, how old was Hoxai at this point? 
um, he was uh, not young in his in the maturity. They were late. This printer. He changed his name. Uh, it's it's no more Hokusai. It's and are very skilled brains. Yes. So uh, his research is about uh, um, perspective are done here and about the chiaroscuro all is uh, mixed and uh, understood. So there is a formal perfection in this print. And I think the he master uh, he masters the are the subject and the technique and the idea uh, the composition. But also I think it's just a phenomenal Incredible recall, incredible memory, an incredible repertoire. Yes, uh, because the Eastern art is a repertoire. Yeah. It is. So, uh, all the prints, if you start looking at the prints, searching repertoires, you can understand the prints are like variation about a thing. And it is not a bad thing, it's great, because you don't have to try to find something new. You have to use it to contact and learn nature and your inside uh, spirit to understand. You can imagine that I'm looking at one of those prints, you could spend an hour or two hours having a very enjoyable time. Yes, so, because they are mechanisms to produce meditation. This is the idea of Eastern art, produce meditation. So they are so abstract and not, and not, not realistic because it's not necessary. I mean, because it's a bit like uh, um, uh, Tula talking about time. I mean, uh, how you uh, how you interpret all the different things going on is, is not um, uh, it's not rational like in a in a Western picture at all. Um, I think there is a very. <laughs> Uh, difference, profound difference between uh, Eastern and Western. That's great. I I don't know why. I'm thinking about it because I'm Western, Western. So, and I'm very fascinated about this these works, but more about prints and less about paintings. So there is a tradition about with in the painting with these things. Rocks, uh, uh, water, uh, sansui is a, a kind of painting, a traditional painting, typical. But the painting is fascinating, beautiful, great. But prints are uh, more um, closer to you, to your sensitivities, in my opinion. Maybe more abstract, maybe because the, the prints were pro produced to be uh, spread and sold. So the simplified and uh, more reflection uh, and abstraction. So they um, work they work better than a painting. Painting is more personal. Uh, prints are less personal. The beauty is not uh, is uh, a consequence of Okusai understanding, not uh, only for these uh, skills, because he was not the printer, he, on, he only drew the... Do, would these prints always, always have been mounted on scrolls? Or no, they? absolutely not. Never, never. Almost never. So they would <laughs> just be seen. They were so back. loose. Yes. Always, always loose. Yeah. Maybe you, you said the people bought the prints and then passed it into uh, the scrolls. I think. Or pasted them directly on the walls or on yeah. the fusuma or anywhere. It I mean, depends on the wall. <laughs> so would you have looked at them that way? Yes. That way. that way if you put it in an album, but that way if it was stuck onto the fusuma or the wall directly. Maybe. They were, they, were, they were made to be stuck up somewhere or stuck into a book. I saw a movie, uh, Akira Kurosawa movie, uh, Jojin Bo, maybe, the, what is the, mm -hmm. you maybe know the movie. And there they were, so yeah. pasted on the Kusuma. I was so surprised <laughs> to yes. see uh, Ukiyo-e there pasted on, on the wall. I have seen Jojimbo many times, but now I noticed the first time the, the ukiyo -e pasted there. Yes, yeah. I was very happy to see uh, There were very popular prints, mm. not value about in art. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Western uh, vision uh, as uh, raised the uh, value, but uh, Western people started to collect. Oriental people uh, went after. So Ota Museum is uh, newer than the older collection at a museum in Tokyo. But as a big collection about uh, but this uh, after European collections. Japanese understand that their uh, capacity from the water water <laughs> I think. But also famous architects and uh, famous critics collected prints in uh, starting the 20th century. Frank Lloyd Wright was a collector and a critic and a dealer. <laughs> yes, yes, and he wrote uh, uh, critics about uh, Japanese prints. There are a lot of sources. Not expected. <laughs> he did. I have a book. A text. He went in Japan to be the big hotel in Tokyo, and he was collect. He was collecting yet the. Uh, print. And there was also a dealer who bought in Japan and then sold in the United States. Yes. Um, and probably, uh, I'm not sure what's happening around the next paper because the uh, next uh, person is not here.